This presentation is on how to evaluate buttress dams um, for risk assessments. And so I'm going to go through a quick outline um, of the presentation. I'm going to start with the load carrying mechanisms and the different types of buttress dams you might come and uh, <clears throat> come across. Run through a couple of case histories, and then the the rest of the presentation will focus in on evaluating the the risk associated with buttress dams with a, a focus on seismic loading. And so we're going to discuss some size things to consider um, from a seismic perspective, present a, a typical event tree related to seismic loading, and then what are some considerations for reinforcing steel, um, how to evaluate concrete members, how to uh, account for the hydrodynamic interaction with the upstream pool, and then discuss um, evalu evaluation using nonlinear finite element analysis. So the, the objectives off the First of all, is that we want to understand the mechanisms that affect buttress dam failure, how to construct an event tree, and estimate the nodal probabilities of that event tree related to failure of a buttress dam. Some key concepts are that buttress dams were constructed mainly in the early 20th century when labor was cheap and materials were expensive. The buttress is saved on concrete, but the light structures required to have an upstream sloping water barrier to <clears throat> help the use the pool to increase the the vertical force down into the foundation and to the buttress to help keep the structure stable. They're designed to carry load in the upstream downstream direction, but generally very little consideration was given to loading in the cross canyon direction, which makes them um, generally susceptible to seismic loading. And then cracking and yielding of the reinforcement members um, does not necessarily equate to failure. So there's other things that will need to be kept in mind and actually to evaluate the likelihood of failing a, a buttress dam. So some load carrying mechanisms. So this is kind of a typical free body diagram. Essentially, you have your upstream pool and it you know, creates not only a horizontal load on the structure, but also a vertical load that is is used to increase the stability, increase the vertical weight in through the buttress and down into the foundation to help make the structure a little bit more stable. Some examples that you might come across are considered slab and buttress, which is also considered a, an Amberson dam. Um, those two names are interchangeable. You could also run across a multiple arch buttress dam. There's also massive head buttress dams and then um, dome buttress dams as well. So running through a couple of case histories, the first one I'm going to discuss is the Vega de Terra Dam, which was constructed in the mid 1950s in northwest Spain. It was 112 foot high dam constructed of masonry and work was suspended during the winter months. And unfortunately, little attention was paid to preparing the joints after the winter shutdown, resulting in poor bond across some of the lift joints. The dam failed upon first filling in 1959, resulting in 144 fatalities. Officially, the failure is attributed to the poor bond at some of the lift joints, but another contributing factor is, you know, keep in mind the, the very steep sloping upstream face. And, you know, as I noted before, the part of the stability of a buttress dam comes from the, the upstream pool being you know, used as a, a vertical load to increase the normal load through the buttress and then into the foundation. And with such a steep sloping upstream face, it's likely that you didn't have much of a normal load to help increase the, the weight on the structure and, and help prevent or in, helped initiate um, sliding along those, those poorly bonded joints. The other case history I'm going to talk about is the Galeno Dam, which was a 160 foot high multiple arch dam. Um, it was constructed with a 52 foot tall masonry plug in the, a deep gorge within the valley center, and it was originally designed as a gravity dam, but was modified during construction to be a multi multiple arch buttress dam. It failed in October 1923 after having been loaded for two months and resulted in 356 fatalities. One of the contributing factors to the failure of the dam was again considered to be a poor quality concrete and this figure just highlights you can clearly see the difference in the type of concrete that was placed you know, within um, different lists within the buttress and you know, likely contributed to you know, failure of the dam. The official report, however, um, 
indicated that the, the failure of the dam was attributed to failure of the masonry plug, which was considered to not be stiff enough nor extend far enough downstream in order to carry the load from the buttress. Now, <clears throat> one of the unique, unique things about this dam is most dams fail upon first filling, whereas this dam actually survived for two months. And so one of the questions is, so what exactly changed in, during that two months that resulted in failure of the project? And one theory is that over during that time, the lime mortar leached out of the plug, allowing it to deform you know, more than what the buttresses can take. And this is kind of supported through the finite element analysis that was done of the dam after failure. And essentially, once the plug was removed from the finite element analysis, it started to mimic a cracking pattern similar to what was seen after the on site after the dam failed. And notice particularly on the upstream side that there's a lot of diagonal cracking within the buttress. And then <clears throat> also notice, you know, from pictures from the, the Galeno Dam after the failure, there's a lot of diagonal cracking within the buttresses itself. And so the really what is attributed to failure is failure of that masonry plug not being sufficient to carry the load. So getting into seismic considerations when evaluating um, a buttress dam. So this is an example of entry where the first couple nodes are related to the loading, related to the reservoir and to the ground motion. And in this particular example, the but there's struts in between the buttresses to provide lateral support. <clears throat> and so the first node is related to failure of those struts and compression, which then leads to mo the moment capacity within the buttresses being exceeded, which results in buckling or excessive deformation of the buttress, which then leads to an a breach and an uncontrolled release of the dam of the reservoir. And so one thing to note, so this particular failure mode, that inventory that I have shown is related to failure of the buttress itself. And, you know, a key component of buttress dams is also the upstream you know, concrete slab or the water barrier. And so you know, that will is another failure, potential failure mode that you will want to consider as well. But the the vent tree in the presentation will then will mostly focus on failure of the, the buttress itself. <clears throat> so when evaluating buttress dams, much like arch dams that was presented in an earlier presentation, we need to model it using finite element analysis, and we're going to have to model the entire structure. Unfortunately, we can't just focus in on certain components. And the reason for that is buttress dams, when loaded in the cross canyon direction, the load has a tendency to cum accumulate across the structure. In order to get a full appreciation of the load on the buttresses, you have to model the entire structure and not just focus in on a, a couple buttresses. <clears throat> so, and also, as was noted with arch dams, is the <clears throat> we need to be careful when we're doing 3D finite element analysis. We don't want to just jump into the most complicated model. We want to kind of take a, a stepped approach and maybe do some simplified analysis, starting with linear elastic, you know, massless foundation. And if that analysis indicates that we could have potential problem or, you know, it develops, you know, cracking that is adverse to stability, you can then move into more sophisticated analysis, but there's no need to just jump into the most complicated model that you, you possibly can because they're very difficult to set up and it's very easy to, to make errors that will give you erroneous results. <clears throat> so one of the key things when evaluating the potential for failure of a buttress dam is considering the reinforcing steel within the buttress itself. Buttresses typically re behave like reinforced concrete structures, and so the, the, re the adequacy of the reinforcing steel is going to be critical. And unfortunately, many of the buttress dams are, are, are old, as I noted that they were mostly constructed in the early 19th or the early 20th century. And so a lot of them have issues with concrete spalls, cracking. Um, a lot of them may not have had the necessary air entrainment, and so they could be susceptible to free to freeze thaw. And so the the condition of the concrete and the condition of the reinforcing steel and the reinforcing details are going to be very critical in um, understanding the, the response of a buttress dam, particularly related to seismic loading. Another thing to keep in mind, as I noted before, the a critical aspect of stability is having a sloping upstream um, 
face to the dam. And so we can't just use any method to calculate the hydro hydrodynamic pressures on the structure. We can't use the simplified Westergaard method because that assumes that you have a vertical face. And so one of the approaches that you can use is the Zangar method. And these two figures highlight how can you how to take the um, geometry of the structure and the reservoir loading and uh, estimate what is the hydrodynamic uh, load acting um, on the the, st the structure from the upstream pool. And then when you actually get into the evaluation of the, the various components, um, in this particular example, again, this buttress dam has struts to provide lateral support. And so how do we take the information out of a finite element analysis and evaluate what's the likelihood of failing the struts first? Um, <clears throat> and so you can take, have a, a stress history plot um, focusing on what is the compressive stresses within the, the struts and compare that to their capacity and determine well how frequently and by what magnitude and for what duration are the compressive stress stress within the struts exceeding its capacity and what's the likelihood of that particular strut to failing and depending upon the type of finite element analysis you're using you may want to do more of an iterative approach whereas <clears throat> so you, you first run the analysis to see which struts are overstressed but then if as those struts start to fail the load will then get redistributed to the adjacent struts and what's the potential for those struts then to become overstressed and so you can initially select which struts you want to focus in on which is the highlighted in yellow in the the top figure run the analysis and it'll give you an indication as to which struts may have their you know, have the, the stress exceed the capacity, you can then remove those struts from the analysis, which is highlighted in the middle figure in red as to which struts we want to remove, and then rerun the, the time history analysis and determine what is the redistribution of the stresses with those removed struts, and is the adjacent struts then themselves become overstressed, which is highlighted in the bottom figure in the blue and the purple. <clears throat> Once we have evaluate the struts then you want to look at what is the um, potential for exceeding the moment capacity within the buttresses and again you can use time history stress plots to determine what's the yeah by what magnitude how often and by what duration is the moment is the flexural stresses in the buttress exceeding the moment capacity of the concrete to determine what's the likelihood of exceeding the moment capacity and potentially getting buckling of the buttress. Another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of buttress dams vary in thickness from the base to the top and so you may need to evaluate multiple elevations in terms of the moment capacity within the buttress and so these are two figures which are very similar and similar to the plot I just showed on the previous slide, but for different elevations, one where the buttress is 32 inches thick and another where the buttress is 26 inches thick. And you can compare what is the, the stress at these two elevations to one, get an idea of at what elevation might you be exceeding the flexural stress. And also, is it warranted to consider multiple uh, elevations in terms of you know, failing the buttress you know, or is there a critical elevation that you need to consider? And, you know, not to try and beat a dead horse, but again, when talking about um, nonlinear finite element analysis, they're, they're not for the faint of heart. And so it's going to be very critical that you validate your model before you start using it. You want to, <clears throat> once you develop the model and you yeah, make your, your various assumptions, you want to run it for a simplistic um, loading that you either know the response or at least highly confident yet what the response will be to make sure that the model is giving you realistic results before you you know fully jump into evaluating the upper load ranges of the the earthquakes that you need to consider and so lastly what are the the key takeaway points and for evaluating buttress dams they're designed to carry load in the upstream and downstream direction, but they're vulnerable in the cross canyon direction, making them yeah, especially susceptible to seismic loading. Finite element analysis are basically gonna be required in order to fully capture the response of the dam. 
reinforced concrete risk concepts are going to be um, important to you know, keep in mind when evaluating the, the various nodes within the event tree for failure of a buttress dam. You want to pay careful consideration to the quality of the concrete and what is its current condition today, what is the, the joint treatment, the reinforcing details when trying to evaluate the potential for failing the various components of, the, of a buttress dam and ultimately leading to breach. And then lastly, the, the level of analysis needs to be commensurate with the level of study. Don't just jump in with the most complicated finite element model that you can. Kind of take a stair-stepped approach, starting with a more simplified model and leading into more complicated models as you go along.